To get started, um, we're really lucky to have uh, Brad Chapman come today. Um, I've known Brad for a number of years, I've met him a couple times, and uh, followed his work for a long time. He, um, Brad is uh, one of the main areas of, of research that, that Brad is involved in, and is trying to develop and compile um, open source, powerful workflows for analyzing genetic area, uh, genomic data in different contexts, from everything from RNA-seq analysis to, to identifying genetic variation both in um, normal and in cancer genomes. Um, and so he's, uh, that, that work is, is, is basically compiled through a, a project called Blue Collar Bioinformatics, which is going to be the focus of uh, this morning's talk. I think the first, the first hour is going to be sort of an overview of what Blue Collar Bioinformatics is, what the goals are, what functionality is available, and then after lunch, um, he's going to take you through what you can actually do with it and think of a practical session, right? Yeah, yeah. So I have like, a, I ran a workflow and it's on this now as I image, and you can SH to it and look at data, play around. With them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it should be great. I think so. The first hour is going to be an overview, and then we'll get, get our hands dirty after. Yeah, if I don't finish, it doesn't mean continue after. It's pretty low key. <laughs> um, yeah, so I definitely please interrupt me during this and let's have a discussion session uh, at this time. So as my standard disclaimer is I'm a programmer, right? Like I almost all day I stare at your computer and like don't talk. So uh, when it's like <laughs> talking for three hours, like oh my, you know. So uh, please like interact with me and I'll try to like solicit feedback. And uh, if you want to follow along like with the slides, um, if you go to that bottom link, it's j.mp, like John, and then BC Bio links, uh, there's a link to this presentation. So if you want, want to like click on anything or as I'm talking, it's all there. Um, and as Aaron said, my name is Brad. I, I work in Boston, live in Boston um, at the Harvard Chan School, which is the School of Public Health. So if you know Boston, it's uh, over the river in the Lawway area. Um, and uh, I'll talk about stuff we're doing around this toolkit called BC Bio, which is, I have a blog called Blue Column Bioinformatics where I write a lot of this stuff. So that's the bcb.io. And so, because I'm all these names are awful because I started this blog and it was called that, and then I just named everything namespace BC Bio and it just sort of stuck. So everything is namespace BC Bio. Um, and so, sort of as the outline of stuff we'll talk about, and like Aaron said, this is totally uh, free form. So I'll try to like kind of talk and give an introduction for the first some time. And then I have a, I ran an analysis and we can talk about that. And we can look at that and uh, sort of look in depth at things. Um, and uh, so I'll start by talking about sort of the motivation for using open source community resources, uh, which is sort of one of the things that we do a little different that distinguishes us from, from, other, uh, from other tools. Um, and an overview of what kind of things you can do in BC Bio, uh, and this is specifically around the variant calling. I just tend to, BC Bio has RNA seq and a small RNA analysis and other things as well, but I tend to do variant calling. Uh, analyses, so I'm better at talking about that. So I'll talk mostly about that. Uh, and then I'll talk about some of the science that we do in BC Bio that I think is cool and unique and sort of new stuff that's upcoming. So stuff around human build 38, the new, uh, and then HLA calling, typing. Um, uh, we do a lot of work on cancer calling. I, where I work at uh, Harvard School of California, kind of like we're in the core. So what that really means is we're like an academic consultant group, and we tend to work with sort of anyone who uh, who wants to work with us on these big projects. And so I spend about half my time this this year so far at uh, AstraZeneca and their oncology group. So I've been doing a bunch of cancer calling recently. So I'll talk about stuff like that and hard problems of cancer calling, uh, and then structural variation. Um, I don't know, Aaron probably ever talked about structural variation, but uh, uh, talk about how we're integrating tools that they've developed and trying to make them easier. And prioritize, and then we can walk through the practical example where I ran a workflow that does like all this new stuff, and you can check it out. Um, and we can sort of play with the outputs and talk about how it works. Uh, so the mo the thing that like the reason we do I do open source stuff, and the reason I try to do this stuff is to try and help people. And so this is a quote. Cool, I was getting together talk. I gave a talk last week. And I know I don't get this many talks. It's great though. So I gave a talk last week also, and I was getting together and. Uh, Karen had posted this on Twitter about you know Fran, whose one-week-old son has a rare disease, and it's 
and this is a substantial, essentially what I do, right? Like I should be able to, like someone could give me their genome and I could help them with this. But if someone came to me with this, I wouldn't know what tools to, I, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't have a website I could point them at or something they could do themselves. You know, I'd have to be like, well, I could analyze your data and help you. But it's kind of sad we're in this space and we can't like give anyone a tool they could go to this website, run something, find out some answers, go to their doctor and be like, hey, you know, this is what I found out, this is what I researched. Um, you know, and so it's really a, you know, how can we work faster and do more science faster? And as a community, we are, we are not, not good at this. We are slow and, uh, and move slowly. So this is my uh, example of uh, Build 38, which so you know, two Christmases ago, December 24th, the day before Christmas, right? Uh, Christmas Eve, uh, the Genome Build 38 is released. So it's been a couple of years now, right? And then this is from Reddit, like a few months ago. Hey, anyone using 38? Should we try searching this new genome? Uh, and it's been, it's, this is a improved, better, awesome, Tons of work, seven years of work into making a better genome. And it's been two years, and really, like, the community is very slow to switch that. Um, and that's a problem, right? Like, we have something better, we should, be, we should be moving towards that. And so, you know, how can we incorporate these things faster? And so, like, in terms of bioinformatics, so I break down the type of stuff I do every day. So there's a bunch of stuff we're doing, uh, installing tools, like, putting tools together, making them work. Uh, testing and validating them, make sure they work on your samples. Um, and, and then that's sort of the stuff that you have to do to do work, right? Like the, <laughs> you know, but um, in the, what you really want to be doing is doing things like improving the algorithms, making them better, uh, scaling. And in the end, really, you know, reading literature, learning what other people are doing, and doing biology, and doing interesting things. So it's sort of a, one of the things that we as a community can do better at is try to do how can we do more biology and less installing tools and messing around and stuff that's ancillary to the actual work that we want to do. And the reason it's so hard is that it's just stuff, even standard type analyses are just not routine. So this is a quote from a, from a paper on the, from the TCGA folks, which uh, they do the Cancer Genome Atlas. Um, and they had, so it's four major genome centers. So the people who know what they're doing right, these genome centers, they should know what they're doing. Um, and they're calling SNPs, uh, which are the easiest thing to call, right? Single nucleotide variants, you should be able to call those. So people that know what they're doing, things they should be seeing, the easiest thing to possibly call. Um, if you compare the calls between them, 31% of the calls were the same between all four. So that's all for it, that's abysmal, right? Like we should be talking about 99.9, .9, how many nines of we have, but the reality is, you know, it's hard, right? Like this is standard, it's not easy to do cancer calling. Um, it's not a finished thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, we need to be working on these type of things. And uh, this is a paper from uh, from uh, Malachi. I'm not sure if he's here right now, but yeah, I think he talked earlier, right? And, uh, um, and Chris Miller at, uh, at Wash U, where they put these callers together. And so, you know, you can, this is, yeah, it, yeah to see but like the you know this is the positive predictive value so how good you're doing this is the you know how how well you're actually calling real things and this is your sensitivity so how how much you're actually detecting and you put together there's four or five different variant colors here combined together an ensemble of those and you're getting at you know 90 90 ish percent precision and 80 percent tpd so you can do these things to try and improve things but we're still at a place where we need to be working improving our algorithms, doing a lot better. Um, and because I feel like that is totally negative so far, I'm actually a super positive person. Um, this is an example of some of the awesome things that we can do when we're working together as a community. So uh, there's a whole ton of names there that the point is you're not supposed to be able to read them. There's so many people, right? Um, but this is from the AXAC Consortium, uh, which is headed up by Danny MacArthur uh, at Broad and has a ton of other people involved where they, took all these resources they had, pulled them together, and made this one awesome you know, community resource that we can use. Uh, and I'm sure people have probably talked about XAC before, so I don't have to hammer on about what it does. But you know, it's a really super valuable community resource that we did by working together and putting everything together. And uh, you know, so I think that's sort of the, that all comes together into what I think the solution to being better at doing these things is to work together as a community. Um, so it's sort of a hard. It's a hard problem. Like, there's a lot. 
Von Franks is awesome, and there's tons of open source uh, work. There's tons of uh, tons of code available, tons of tools that do things. Uh, and then one of the challenges um, is how to put those things together and get people working together. Like the science has sort of two two components, right? One is like we're all trying to work together and do awesome and do better at science. The other is well, I got to get a grant, I got to do better, and I got to have my tools, that kind of thing. And so, you know, it's a it's always a big challenge how to get people working and building things. Together. And so, you know, I, I sort of wanted to, in talking, motivate for, you know, when you're doing the max work, one of the things that is, we really need to be working together is working together as a community. And to make that, so what we do practically is try to uh, build up a community by identifying shared, uh, shared problems that lots of people have. So uh, things that are, pre-competitive, right? Things that, you know, no one, everyone wants to do well, but doesn't have anything to do with the biology you're doing or the type of product you're trying to do or the drug you're trying to, to target on. Um, you know, everything is, and so things like that are very common, right? Like everyone needs good variants and then you get those together and then you can do some work on them downstream. Uh, and so these are sort of shared problems that academics have in industry and startups and everyone. And uh, what we try to do is then put these together into a, into a tool um, that, that, that people can use, uh, and we work a ton on validation, so making sure that things actually run and work, um, and how well they do, uh, which is which is an important thing, um, and then work on scaling the tools, so they work on real uh, samples, and then supporting the community users. So, um, the way I describe the stuff we do is white box software, so uh, black box software, I guess, you know, something you would buy from a, typically buy from a vendor that would do an analysis at sort of a real high level, right? Like I input reads and, you know, up, on the other side I get out variant calls and then I deal with those variant calls. And I think that's awesome. It's a good, it's a really useful layer of abstraction to not have to worry about all the details all the time, right? Like if I just want to call variant calls well on something, I want to use a tool that does that. I don't have to cobble together all the tools that do that and make it happen. Um, but on the other hand, you're also doing science, and it's always, because there's, things are so complicated, right? You're going to have something slightly different than the assumptions they're making. You like to dig in and deal with it. And so you need to be able to go inside and see what's happening. And so what we do is try to put together tools that, that do that sort of high-level processing, but then you can open up and you can see everything that's happening. So all the code is available. Um, all the assumptions and methods are documented. Um, and you can go into Tinker and play and do whatever you want. I mean, this is a Raspberry Pi in a box right, that I found a picture of on the internet. But, um, you know, it's a good sort of example. It's like, you know, you, if you want to just leave, treat it as a box and just work with it, it's cool. Um, but if you want to go in and, and Tinker, you can do stuff with Raspberry Pis. I don't know what you can do with Raspberry Pis. Those are cool things, right? Um, I'd like to learn. Uh, so just to make that kind of pretty, you know, it's all sort of abstract. Um, the tool that I'm talking about is called BC Bio Next Gen. Um, it's that big giant arrow in the middle. I just call it BC Bio because um, at this, I'm doing this for this working on this for five years, and I did the initial naming, so I'm responsible, right? But I it was you know four or five years ago it was cool if you called stuff Next Gen, right? And now it's not cool anymore, right? It's not, it's not Next Gen anymore. It's the current gen sequencing, so you just call it BC Bio. It's, it's totally fine. Uh, but what it does is it integrates a whole ton of tools and provides scaling and resiliency. So, you know, on a, on a high level, you take some samples that come off the sequence server and you take a configuration file and you put it in this tool. And on the other side, you get variants. So you get SNPs, Indel, structural variants. Um, and you get all these quality metrics that that associated with that. So how well the alignment did, how well the how well the calling did, um, how good your coverage is, things like that. And then that also feeds into downstream analysis tools. So I'm sure I remember I talked about Gemini earlier. Um, so you know, it generates a Gemini database that you can, it's ready to go, that you can use uh, downstream. Um, you know, hooks into other things that you want to do for visualization and querying. Um, and that's, that's, that's fair in calling. We also do RNA-seq analysis, so similar type things with RNA-seq and, and small RNAs as well. And you know, if you're, I, there's a private like a few other times, but you know if you're interested in this at all, it's on GitHub uh, under chat and BBC Lab next gen. Um, it's all free to build, open source. As you can probably guess by my big community spiel at the beginning. Um, so 
just to kind of make that practical, we well, this is what we don't do, right? These are tools that, that we use. So uh, you know, it's just a it's meant to be a giant list of tools, right? Not like a <laughs> read through everything, but probably things that you've already people have been talking about and learning. You know, use BWA for alignment, use you know Freebase, GDK for calling, um, you know, use Stalker and couplings and, and that kind of thing for RNC. Uh, use standard tools for for quality control and manipulation. Um, so what we're trying to do is, you know, I'm. I mentioned doing science faster, that means not repeating ourselves, not doing the exact same thing over and over again, right? So anytime there's a tool that already does something, we try to incorporate it. So, um, you know, the and we do a lot of the work to make the install very easy. I can show you sort of that later, but you just get, people make fun of the BCBot installation, they call it downloading the internet, because you get uh, 10 billion tools uh, that do all this thing, because we're trying to reuse as much as people, as as we can, uh, so we make it really easy to install and use all those things. So, so we use a ton of stuff. Uh, we install like a million things, uh, <laughs> and uh, and what it, what it provides. That's all stuff we use, right? What it does at the end is make a community. So, uh, oh, sure, go ahead. Sorry. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank so, you. Sorry, I'm blabbing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you install all of these tools in order to run um, BC Bioconnection because they use different parts of it. Process, right? That's right. But yeah. do you get like workable instances of all those tools individually as well, or are they scale to kind of be bits and pieces of the actual tools that you need in like the pipeline? Yeah. So it's, it's all cool. so it's all those tools are installed for you. So if you install BC Bio, you get like every single probably every single tool everyone's talked about. Um, you get yeah, that's that. pretty awesome because it's really like for me at least it's been really tough to figure out all like the installation of the different tools and to that effect. Like, if you try to install one tool, maybe it works, and you go to install another tool, and you realize you're missing something else. Do you have all, like, you know, I, I guess, is, is it pretty, I guess we'll find out, but is it, is it pretty easy to, to do the installation process, or is it because you're installing all of these, you know, different independent tools, is there you know, problems that can arise because of that? Yeah, so, I spend, I have an alternative version of this talk where I go on and on about the amount of time I spend on installation issues. Um, but yeah, we, it's, it's, the short answer is it installs everything, all the tools, just the normal way, um, and should be one step, like a single command that will do all the installation and should run on pretty much any uh, Unix -y type system, uh, Linux -y type system, or uh, OS X is, is an unprompt for some tools, but. Um, yeah, so you'll get along with BC, if you even if you don't use BC Bio, you could use the installer to install every single thing in the world that uh, you want to use, um, which is pretty helpful as well. Uh, so I mean, one of the things we're trying to do is make that process seamless because it's doing installation sucks, right? It's like who wants to do that? So um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, to answer your question, yeah, definitely, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, so installs everything in the world. Um, and there's, if you're into the, oh, but sure. Is it, so if you have some of these tools installed already, will it install them in parallel, or will it actually overwrite what you already have and yeah. then utilize those? Yeah, so it does try not to overwrite because that's bad, or anything. you put multiple <laughs> installations of the same software on it. Yeah, yeah. So what, what it does right now is sort of a, if you ever use modules or something on a, does a similar type of thing where it just installs into an isolated directory and then you can add that to your path and then you get all the tools. Yeah. So you can add that to your path and not the path if you want the tools that are in there. Um, so it, it tries not to stop on what you have and just lets you inject the stuff that PC Bio installs just by changing your path to a point to there. Um, like for in the future, if you're into like nerdy techy stuff, there's the uh, this thing called containerization and Docker is sort of the, the if you've heard of that, is like the um, the primary method that people do that, and that creates like a fully isolated environment where you can install things as well. And we also have a version of BC Bio that does that. Um, it's not as widely supported right at um, in some typical HPC system you find it called at your university, but uh, that's I think that in the future it will be completely isolated and completely uh, transparent what you're using. I mean, because one thing that's really important is knowing what tools you ran and being able to rerun them again in the future. And that kind of thing. So. Cool. Yeah, I have some questions. So, the awesome. question is, uh, uh, what the platform uh, for 
the window is hands off through the same one, or it also supports a negative label for window operating system? So Windows, yeah, I think it's going to be tough right now. I think that, uh, I mean, it's not anything about the stuff that we wrote in BCPI always would work on Windows. It's a lot of the tools just don't compile run on Windows. Um, what? There's there are two things. One is using Amazon. Uh, you can use it on Amazon. And so just install the stuff there and run it there. Uh, and then there's, there's a pre-built AMI that has to run as well. So that's one sort of way to do it. The longer term thing is this Docker solution as well. Um, that will install everything inside a virtual machine, inside of Docker. So it's like a little bit of thing on your machine. I think that's probably the longer term thing. But if you were to do it today, it would not be very straightforward. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, how big now currently is the size of hardware? Oh, of the tools. Of the code tool, yeah. Uh, so the tools themselves are, I think it's like two gigs or something like that. Uh, and then it also does the work of installing all the data as well. So that will sort of depend on what you want. Um, but the yeah. So. Uh, Last question is uh, for the update. So please continue to release the new uh, version. Uh, so that too will automatically check the updates, or we have a manual to do that. Yeah. So there's a there's a, it has also has an up in addition to the install being easy. There's an the update process where you just do update and it will pull in all the new tools and stuff. It doesn't happen automatically because it, it don't, you know, if you're relying on a certain version of tools and you're working on something, it's be pretty frustrating to have an update to something new, but you can do it and it, you want to do it and test the new version as well. Um, so the idea is, I talk a little about this, this is uh, about keeping up with tools is, is kind of the thing we're trying to do. Um, and uh, you know, this sort of tries to make the update process easy so you can keep getting to the newest stuff and keep moving forward. <coughs> Thanks guys for all the questions. It's awesome. I like talking to people. It's, uh, it's awesome. So uh, yeah, that's uh, a <laughs> That's uh, that's all the installation of tools and data. We do all that stuff. That, that seems like we had a lot of questions about that. Um, and the the reason we do this is because I mean I've talked about this before, but um, you know what you what methods you use makes a, a huge difference, right? Um, you can literally, you know, you can go out there and you can find you can write a shell script that will convert a PM file into a PCM file, you know, and you can get calls, right? But it's hard to know really like how well those, how good those calls are. Are they, are they really sensitive? Are they precise? You have no idea, right? And that's the part where there's a ton of work that goes into making that happen. Um, and you know, the so the value we're trying to provide is in finding that out as a community, knowing what the best thing the things are, putting that together in one place, and then making it easy to to use. Um, and so uh, this is by. Uh, the, the, if you also you work in this this space, uh, there is a lot of pipelines now. So uh, this is a another slide. That the point is you can't read all this stuff. The text is on it, right? But uh, this is from uh, I think the C pipe paper where they you know big paragraph about explaining why they wrote a new pipeline tool when all these other pipeline tools exist, right? Um, so you know there's a the reality is there's a lot of different the poor pipeline is really overloaded, right? It can mean anything from shell script that someone wrote to like something that's a huge thing um, and they all sort of have different uh, different components and so you know I, I, I now have to motivate why it's worthwhile to work on this or why you know I think this is a useful thing to learn over many of the other pipelines um, and the I think the key thing for that is uh, sustainability so this is a, a cool quote from uh, the software carpentry folks um, about what it means for a tool to be sustainable, but means a piece of software is being sustained and people are using it, fixing it, and improving it rather than replacing it. So um, pretty simple, but it's, you know, it's, uh, this is a, building tools like this is a hard space to kind of keep, keep being able to sustain and support them. Um, you know, the, there is a dichotomy between like, a, you know, this sort of software development and what happens in science and you want to keep moving on to the next thing. Um, not helping everyone do your old thing, um, you know, because no one said, gives you money for that. So it's definitely a challenge to see to keep that up. And I mean, the other thing that you know we kind of talked about, just 
you, you, you touched on just before is that things change really quickly in next gen. So this is I said it's been going on for a few years, and uh, this is the GATK best practices pipeline, which probably folks have talked about earlier in the course. Um, but uh, you know, since I've been doing this, there's been uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different iterations of the GATK pipeline, right? You know, it did. When I first implemented this in BC Bio, that was like what this initially was, was like, hey, run the GHP best practice pipeline. There wasn't really a way to do that. Um, so we did that, and then it's version one, and it's version two. And, and so the point is things are changing rapidly. There's new tools, uh, and all these updates are completely new, right? Like there's new variant callers, new totally new algorithms, totally new ways to do them. And you know, it's a shame to be doing that stuff over and over again. And it's a lot of work to be doing that over again. And that's why you know it's hard to maintaining tools. And so this is, uh, this is a, if you, if you ever go on GitHub, they have like a little graph of like activity over time. And so I think it's a little washed out looking here, but uh, this is 2010, way over there. Here's today, 2015. This is how things have been going. So we've been doing, the point is we've been doing this for about five years and keeping it going and still active and all that kind of stuff. So really working on, on as a community, sustaining this project and keep it moving. Um, in the future, and you know, a big component of that is is support. And you know, no matter how good you make something, it has it has issues because system specific issues as well. Um, you know, one of the goals we try to do is make it easy so things just run. But when they don't run, you need to need help or any questions. And so you know, we've there's this is I don't know whether it's good or bad, right? That there's 1,092 support requests over time, right? So we've dealt with a lot of issues trying to help people um, and that's one thing we we do a ton of is trying to sort of both make the tool available and also build a community around supporting it as well um, and uh, and so if you know if this is stuff that's of interest to you uh, it's on github um, and we welcome contributions we've had a ton of uh, different people contributing to it um, and, and been lucky to do that and sort of welcome new people contributing and, and feedback as well. And the other, the final sort of community oriented thing we try to do is around documentation. So if things, things can be cool and they're all good, but um, if you don't have any documentation on how to run them, it's pretty hard to figure out what's happening. So we have a, a pretty big documentation site. Uh, and you know, the, the teaching materials are actually on there as well. Uh, I thought this was, this is a great, I mean, I appreciate Aaron inviting me and it's also a good excuse to get together better documentation <coughs> you can always do more work on. So uh, the stuff I put together today is available there as well. Um, so that's all that. So that's that's the first sort of what is BC Bio and this type of stuff we're doing. Um, is that all cool? Or you're all good? Okay. Um, so, you know, I, the, the rest I want to talk sort of about science stuff. I don't know, I'm a biologist, my background. Oh, yeah, question, question. awesome. Yeah. So, say you guys have a tool in a package that you currently use, but it stops like being updated and like being maintained. And, like, do you guys kind of keep keep track of that, or is that something that, like, yeah, I don't know, like, or some, some tool kind of starts to starts stop maybe most people are using it, and other people stop using other tools. Like, is that something you guys take into account, or do you try to keep everything available? Uh, so it's kind of a balance. Um, I mean, you know, I think we just try to keep moving forward is sort of the real goal. So like there's a good example is like GTK or like Baron Calling, like used to use Unified Genotyper, which is their original caller, and now there's a new caller, Apple caller. And there's still support there for Unified Genotyper, but it's probably a bit gradual way because no one used it anymore. Um, you know, and if someone wanted to do it, they would be fixed, whatever it's wrong. But you know, the, the general notion is move forward, don't use that anymore. Use the new one, use the better one. So, um, you know, I think when something comes around that's better, it's like less of a place to do it. You know what? Uh, you know, some of the focus, a lot of the focus is on, the reproducibility focus around like we're getting the exact same results you got before, um, which is one useful way to do things. But I think another way to think about it is like get the equivalent of biological result you got before, right? So if you, you know, if you ran top hat and couplings and stuff, and you got, you know, some specific output, you know, you should be able to run new stuff like sailfish or cleese or something and get the same results that you get in the biology is the same, you know. 
So I think that's the level we try to focus at being very reasonable on as much as we can. Cool. We were talking before the top of the computers too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, cool. So this is the sciencey stuff. I'm a sci like I'm a scientist. Uh, my my background's actually in plant biology, so I'm all uh, I've been doing human stuff for a while, but uh, all my went to school for plant biology. So I like talking about science, and uh, you know I think one of the things that we do a lot in BC Bio is try to be moving moving science forward and trying to do sort of stuff that people aren't already doing or aren't already available in existing pipelines. So. You know, we have Aaron Collin, we can do those kind of things, but so will a lot of other places. Um, so these are some things I think we do well that, and also in the, the practical example goes through these that might be of interest to you guys and sort of demonstrates the stuff we're doing. Um, so the first thing I'll talk about is human. So I don't know how many people are do human stuff versus anything else. And human is there. There's a lot of human people, sorry, if you're not human. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, like I mentioned, I did all of them. Everyone's human, right? Everyone's human. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I, I feel, I feel, I gave a talk at, when I went back to, where I went to grad school at, and I feel terrible now because I do all human analysis stuff, and the tooling for human is, is much, there's a lot more resources for doing human stuff than you are, but um, about, almost everything in BC Bio works on other organisms as well. Um, the more, Human-ish it is, probably the better it is, right? Like if you're doing the wheat genome and you're trying to assemble the wheat genome, like we don't have a lot for that, right? It's pretty specialized, but if you're doing, as I'm, all my examples from the plant, but if you're doing a rabbit opposite, then you're calling, you know, things should work pretty well um, with that. Uh, but so I'll go through human stuff. Hopefully if it's of interest to people who are not, uh, don't do human analysis. Um, so the sort of current human build, uh, the one that most people use is called a GRC H37. GRC is the Genome Reference Consortium and Human Build 37. Um, and confusingly, the UCSC folks call it uh, HG19. So it's prior from both ways. But that's the current, um, and it's been, and I guess it's like seven, eight years old now. Um, and you know, this, this sort of slide shows all these different like dots and colors and all that stuff on there are regions where there's now, where there's been patches and fixes where they're trying to improve the genome without changing the reference coordinates um, uh, over time. And the current, the current genome, the one that I mentioned earlier, is, is 38, uh, which all those dots have been replaced by, uh, by these green arrows, which are alternative loci. Um, so the reality of, is that you can't represent humans any, you can't represent any genome with a single static linear uh, build, right? You know, like there's, we have amazing diversity of people, we have amazing diversity of genomes. Uh, you know, any subpopulation is going to have unique insertions and deletions and other stuff that can't be represented as a single graph. So, what the new genome build, which is called 38, uh, and so it's GRC H38 now and, and HD38, so you can at least like always refer to it as 38 and it won't be as confusing. Uh, but what it does now is represent all those those regions before that had patches and fixes now are all these alternative loci. So, you know, instead of just thinking of the genome as one linear thing, you now have a linear thing plus these alternatives at different places. Um, and so I'll talk more about this sort of representation and graph, graph representation later, but it's a really, really useful way to think about how to represent diversity um, and a you know, better way to do things. So it's an awesome, uh, Genome, uh, you know, for variant calling specifically, it has um, it had these alternative loci better representation. Just fix a lot of problems that you can't identify um, before. So this is a slide from uh, Deanna Church that I stole. Uh, but you know, it's pretty simple. You know, if you you know if this, if your sample has you know two genes, uh, one and two, um, but the reference assembly is missing one of those, when you align to it right, instead of aligning to the actual two genes, you align to Everything just goes here because there's nothing else to it. You know, that's not there, so there's nowhere to align it to. So this is the best probably place. So it goes there. And then everything in this purple, you know, looks like a snip there. You know, so it looks probably like a heter heterozygous snip there because there's, there's two things. But it's not a snip, right? It's just that it's not aligning to the actual place in the genome. So, you know, 38 has, all, has a lot better representation. So things are actually going to align to the correct place. And, you know, this is a just a really simple advantage, but if you, you know, if you try to 
conceptually it's simple, but if you don't try to go through and actually distinguish what's real from not, you know, there's this for smaller the, the percentage of, of stubborn false positives are from this sort of issue that 38 clears up a lot of things. Another thing that it does an awesome job of is collapse repeats. This is a personal thing that annoys the heck out of me. Um, because it, in, in 37, uh, near the near the centromeres, this is a, you know, I don't know, this comes on one, right? This is a centromere right here. You know, near the ends of these are these, uh, it's a big repetitive structure, right? And you can't really resolve it correctly. So what they did in 37 is just put in a representation of that repeat. Um, but the reality is there's a ton of DNA there. It's long. We don't know how long it is, right? It's all repeats. And if you just sequence the whole genome and then align to that, what happens is that, that repeat, they call it a collapse repeat, you know, it soaks up all those repeats that you actually sequenced, it's your normal representation, and then you get a <coughs> high depth uh, region there. Uh, that's garbage, right? It's just, you know, repeats piled up. But, so you don't really need to call variants there, it's not a big deal, but the problem is, you know, you're going, a lot of software will go through and call, and then all of a sudden, you know, you have, you have 60x, 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 then you have 100,000 x coverage of this thing, right? So then your memory explodes and it causes all kinds of issues. So it's, it's, an, it's annoying because you don't care about it at all, but it causes lots of practical issues. And so a lot of those are fixed in, uh, in 38. It's awesome. It's, it's really, like when I started using 38, it's, you're like, well, that, was, that whole problem of the memory exploding went away because uh, it's actually like, correctly represented now. So, uh, um, so just, but the issue, I guess, has been that 38 is better, everyone knows it's better, um, it's cool, right? But uh, people haven't really been moving to it. So one thing we tried to do recently was uh, motivate for this by having validation sets. So, um, so 37 has a lot of awesome resources for validating variant calling. There's a, uh, I'll talk about some of the projects later, but um, there's Genome in a Bottle and the Illumina Platinum Genomes have these reference sets that you produced and you can you can do you can run a variant calling analysis, compare it on these known samples, compare against them, and see how you're doing. And that's really really valuable. And it just didn't exist for 38 yet, um, which is a which is an issue. So what we try to do in BC Bio is is put together a validation that we could show that is 38 better, is it worse? Can we move to this? How is it doing? Right? Um, can we provide resources for that kind of validation? And so what we did is do, do that same variant calling on, on two builds, the 37 build and the 38 build, uh, with two different validation sets. <laughs> this whole thing is like two of each thing. I don't know, it sort of happened that way, but uh, <laughs> two validation sets, uh, and then um, the genome and model one, uh, which is one reference set, and then Illumina has a, another reference set as well. Um, and then we, because these resources don't exist for 38, right, so, well, Genome, platinum genome does, but let's talk about genome that model doesn't. It only has a call set for 37. Um, if you want to make that call set available for 38, how do you do that? And so the, the traditional method is these liftover methods where you take the coordinates from 37 and convert them into 38 coordinates, and then you can use them there. So that's an imperfect way to do things, like the better way is to reanalyze everything on the new genome. But uh, some resources are very, like the exact, exact resource I mentioned earlier is a huge, gigantic resource. It's, you know, took, I'm sure, some ridiculous amount of compute cycles to, to generate, and it's a big challenge to redo that in 38. So, you know, this liftover sort of way to take things that are available on one and convert them into the other. Uh, so we did two of those to look at how those do. Uh, we looked at two 38 builds, so I mentioned there's those alternative uh, alleles with and without those to see the effect of those. And then two different variant callers, uh, Freebase and GT Capital Caller. And so if you, you know, if you want, I'll just talk through some of the stuff. But if you want to read about this, it's on the blog there and uh, sort of all the details. Um, but the, you know, I think the most important thing is to have reference materials. So I talked about validation before, and uh, you know, to do validation and know how methods do, you need to have some kind of truth set. And I like working in the variant calling space because people are really good at generating these these community truth sets that we can all work together on. So, like a, a lot of people work on RNA seq, and there's like every group has their own sort of truth set, and this truth set is better than that truth set, and this truth set does that, and this truth set doesn't do that. And it's hard to sort of compare and move tools forward when you don't have the standard sort of truth set you're trying to. Um, trying to work on it. So the variant calling community has done a really good job of putting that together. And 
you know, one, um, the Genome in a Poggle Consortium is sort of the initial initiative that did that. It's uh, from the National Institutes of Standard and Technology. Um, and it was a, they, they used this uh, NA12878 uh, human genome, which is one of the thousand genomes and have map samples. That's a, I don't know, it's a Utah population, right? So uh, it's for Aaron's uh, neck of the woods. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, it's just widely sequenced. I don't know why they picked, I don't know why people picked that one to start sequencing a lot, but they did. Um, and so that's, that's the true set they put together. Um, but what I think the important thing it did was create a community around trying to build these true sets. And, that's rolled over into the General Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which is GA4GH, so, um, which is a, a sort of global standards community that tries to sort of put all these things together. And there's a benchmarking team that does it as well. And I'll talk about cancer calling later, and there's, a, there's an awesome, the ICGC, sorry, all the acronyms, right? ICGC TCGA Dream Mutation Calling Challenge um, is, is a bunch of folks that get together and, and make uh, they're synthetic data sets, but really practical, like simulating the tricky parts of cancer formation um, data sets. And uh, they uh, they have a bunch of true sets that they use um, for calling with. And so, you know, I think these these reference fields are super valuable. Uh, and here we use the genome in a bottle and aluminum just, one. Just a quick comment. Yeah. The reason she's sequenced or chosen is A, access to a lot of material to maintain but. Uh, DNA from her parents, her husband, her husband's parents are all available, and she had 11 offspring. So um, if you're actually just trying to study the Nova mutation, you can actually look at what gets passed on to the other two generations. So just like a really good quality. Yeah. So it's, if you want people to see what you don't have a lot of kids, so it's yeah. so <laughs> 11 kids, I would. <laughs> oh. I have two kids, so, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, so just to, to kind of be practical about sort of the things that, so this is the sort of stuff that BC Bio outputs um, to give you validation. So kind of walk through what it looks like. Um, so the two things are, the two sort of metrics here are false negative rate and false discovery rate. So uh, false negative rate is one minus the sensitivity. So um, that's how, how well you're doing at detecting mutations. Um, and false discovery rate is uh, one minus the precision. So that's how many false positives you have, how, how much many false positives you're generating. And so you sort of do one minus because plotting, uh, when you, a lot of these you have, you're talking about 99.9% .9 sensitivity. And so if you plot that, it's not very useful because you have a flat graph and you can't tell the difference between anything. Um, and if you don't start your graph at zero, then it looks bad, right? So uh, you invert that, um, and then you get rid of that problem. So the the upshot is the smaller the bars, the better off you are, right? The close the closer you are this way, the better off you are. Um, but what BCBio does is it spits out these these graphs like this, um, where you know it's divided the top two panels there are SNPs, and the bottom two are indels, um, and then it gives you comparisons between them. So maybe I should use Cool. So uh, you know this just to take an, and I, and then we have the two different variant colors. This is free base and this is GAT haplotype color. Um, and uh, you know the thing that you can see sort of for SNPs is in the throw. I'm sorry, I should walk through everything. This is the three different genome builds, right? So there's HD19 or the you know sort of standard. Uh, um, the 37 build that a lot of people are using. This is the new build, HD 38, and this is HD 38 without the alternative alleles. So just sort of the base genome without the, all the alternates. Um, and so you know, for 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 the, and I mentioned smaller is better, right? So you can see you know you're detecting more stuff already with SNPs with HD 38 um, than you were with 19. Um, the cool thing I think is the this reduction in false positives. So um, you know, this is the stuff that's left that's false positives in this genome are really are those hard to reach places that you don't know what to do with, right? Like this genome has been over analyzed and over uh, optimized for, so you should be really good at it. And you know, you're you're just you're cutting them in half with just changing the genome build, which is pretty sweet. And 
that's really all. And you can see here with the alts, no alts versus alts, like that's pretty much all from adding those alternative alleles and mapping to the right place. You take away those alts and then your false positives jump. So, you know, it's really a nice validation that this, this genome is really useful as doing a practical thing. Just by using the update genome, you get rid of a bunch of false positives. Uh, and it's really providing a lot of value um, for that. And you see GHDF, the color, same sort of pattern of things there. Um, and then indels are more complicated, like they always are. Um, so, you know, a lot of the, in the indels, it's, it's a little hard to figure out what's happening, because I mentioned smaller is better, so, um, you know, the HGN has less false negatives, uh, but it also has less total uh, indels. So there's, you're detecting more indels in the new one, and I don't think our things are very tuned for that. So, you know, you're, you're sort of, you have a big trade-off, right? Like, you're not quite as sensitive with all your calls, but you're also detecting more. So. Uh, 38 looks good, right, if you're getting more stuff. Um, I think we're probably at the beginning of trying to get our colors working well on 38 and detecting all the new indels and this things. Um, and that's sort of the case for both Freebase and uh, GATK with that color. Um, and then you're also, uh, you know, you're a little bit worse here with the false discovery rate as well. So SNPs is pretty clear. It's awesome, right? Way better. Go for it. Yeah, so. Yeah, so Getting back to people not switching over to 30, yep. do you think this is part of the reason, like, in this stuff and, you know, in anything that you upgrade your operating system on your phone or something like that, like, you always want to wait and let everybody else screw themselves over by switching over too soon and then yeah, people yeah. work out the bugs and then switch over to it? Yep. Do you think that it's that mentality that's kind of what people are waiting to hear, you know, how these type of tools are performing? Yeah, I think that's definitely it. Yeah, I definitely. Yeah, like, well, someone else will figure it out, and then, you know, when everyone else is using it, then I'll switch over, right? But, you know, until someone's the first person, then, uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's, that, I mean, that was our motivation for trying to do this. Is like, we, you know, we wanted to take advantage of 38, but people say the same thing, like, I don't want to upgrade You know, it's fine. My phone worked from 2006 works, right? You know, you don't need to upgrade. I used to have a really old phone. I could have busted it out, and it could have been like, let's see, I used the old phone, but, uh, um, yeah, so that, that's exactly it, I think. Also, a ton of inertia. I mean, the same thing happened from build 36 to build 37. It's basically like a three to even four year adoption and transition. Um, and a lot of people wait for the uh, resources like Ensemble and UCSC to make all the annotations that were available mm -hmm. before completely available again and we build. That's, we're still in that transition. You know, yeah, that's it. That's definitely it. So I guess, I miss, why is the false negative rate higher for the HG38 or Indels? Yeah, so it's, there's, it's confusing, yeah, because there's, it's, it's a little better for SNPs from 1.4 to 1, 1, you know, percent. Yeah, yeah. But, but the Indels, the false negative rate went up. Actually, it did, yeah. 2%, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and it's, and I don't know if you can see the numbers, it's, it's, it's a little, there's, there's more representation, so you're finding more Indels. So, like, this has got, 32, uh, 324,000, this has got 291,000. So it's, I, I'm not, the target is bigger, the target is bigger and we're not, a, we're detecting more, but we're not as good at sort of detecting all of the new target, I guess. And then extra target is the worst spot. Probably, yeah, exactly. But, but what's the truth set here? This is uh, the platinum genome, so <laughs> they, but, but they, they did recall on 38, so. Uh, but it's but it is but it's using like tools that are optimized for thirty seven, right? So like they're yeah. they didn't like invent a new thing, right? They used GHK and other tools to, to so do the calling were, out. Those are validated indels that were discovered in an A plus seven eight. Because one thing that could be going on is they were just they're they're not false positives yeah. that were found in build thirty seven and in and A plus seven eight that are no longer being called in build thirty eight because they were fixed in the assembly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's definitely yeah. I mean, so you know, I think it's a there's there's gray area definitely here. Um, you know, I like the takeaway was this is good, right? Like we're getting more stuff. Like it seems totally within the realm of what happens. But um, you, I think like once we start working more on this, this this sort of thing will make a little more sense. And if you want to really this is this slide confuses it even more because uh, if you want to be really confusing because it takes the uh, genome in a bottle samples, which are only prepared on 37, and 
could just a comparison with those. And so what that what that introduces in addition to all those things that happen there, it's also got a lift over step where it takes the 37 and converts it to 38. So you have the error from the 37 plus the error inherent in there plus the error from uh, whatever and plus the error from just like the analyses and things. So you, you compound all your different errors together uh, into one set of comparisons. Uh, but it's useful to sort of see is it cool to do this uh, mapping over, right? Like does it totally destroy everything or can you actually detect things are okay. And so, um, so like this is 37 at the bottom here, and then uh, these are 38 in sort of two different ways of doing it. One is uh, this cross map tool, and that's, uh, that's sort of more like a lift over type approach, that's NCBI's, uh, uh, sorry, that's, uh, that's the UCSC sort of approach, and then there's Remap, which is the NCBI approach. Um, everyone has their own way of representing the differences that's better or worse than the other one. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the this has got a lot of the same stuff. So this is like, you can dig this for, for hours if you'd like to stare at these, which I do. But, um, you know, the, the 38 is, the cross map actually did on par with that, um, which is pretty reasonable. Um, Considering this is like completely optimized for 37 and lifted over, so everything that's painful is lifted over. Um, and you know what I think it says is that you can lift over and you can do okay. You, the the hard stuff is going to be hard and it's not going to work well, but um, you get the majority of the signal by lifting it over, um, <coughs> which is cool. So just to sort of summarize that, uh, you know, I think the the thing on for SNPs. Uh, build 38 is way better, right? Uh, unambiguously better, right? It's more sensitive, uh, reduces false positives. Uh, for indels, um, it's it's detecting more, so there's more stuff there that you can detect with the new rebuild. Um, but it, you clearly need to work more on the sensitive and precision, just to figure out what's happening. Um, and then for the remapping, this is for you know this like I mentioned, this is for resources that aren't <coughs> available on 38 that you're not going to be available soon. Um, and you can, uh, you know, those those two tools are there: cross map and NCBI remap. Uh, both seem good. Um, remap is uh, it has all this like additional sensitivity in these like. Deanna Church tried to explain it all to me, and I don't understand it all. But uh, there's a lot of different uh, representations underneath that uh, that they can use, um, which is cool. But it definitely takes some tuning to sort of figure it out to get it to the point we had it. I had to tune it some. Uh, cross map is pretty straightforward. It's a pretty easy tool to use. So, if I were to just remap something and I wanted, I would just use cross map. It's pretty pretty straightforward. Um, if you want to do more research on it, remap is also awesome. Um, so that's sort of the 38. Uh, you know, global. It's not as bad. It's not bad. You can switch to it. It's all good, right? Um, argument. The other argument is, well, what about what things can you do with 38 that are hard to do in 37? Um, what sort of tangible benefits can you get? And, you know, I think one major one is uh, HLA typing. So HLAs are, you know, the, the, they're ridiculously important, right? Like, it, it, you know, everyone has sort of their unique HLA type, and it, it determines your immune response to a bunch of different things. Um, you know, and it's something that, you know, you can use that we just completely ignore in 37 because we're garbage at doing it, right? The HLA regions are poorly represented. They're, you know, Super complex thing. There's a whole like, database of of different HLAs. Um, we don't map correctly to them. They get they basically get sorted out, uh, and so we have no ability to assess this like, really important hypervariable part of the genome. Uh, and we don't do a good job at all of typing it. And you'd have to, if you want to get HLA typed, you need to like you know send different things for Sanger sequencing, do some HLA typing thing that did it uh, with your doctor. But we're doing the sequence and whole genome. Right? We should be able to type these and. Uh, and figure it out. Um, and so what happened in, in 38 is the, uh, a big change in the tooling to support those alternative alleles. So the, this, is, this is from the BWA documentation. Um, so what it's, what it's trying to show is there's the, in the middle, uh, just stand on this desk with you. Uh, but yeah, this is the, you know, this is a sort of standard chromosome and you have this representation here and then it shows two alternative uh, here and here, um, and so what what happens here is this this is the read, and it actually maps best to this alternative contig, which is a novel 
insertion relative to the reference genome, right? So it's only in here. And it actually maps better here. Um, it's sort, and there's a similar thing upstream, so it almost maps right here, and then almost maps a couple times this alternative kind of take as well. Uh, and so what would happen in the old build um, is it wasn't, no one was really aware this was an alternative kind of take, so the, none of the software was available. Was, everyone's aware, right? But the software was not, did not know it's an alternative, so it looks like it maps two places. It's a multi-mapper, it's not mapping so good. We're not sure what's going on. The signs of a low quality score are most tools filtered out and you don't assess it at all. Um, what happens in the new version is it, you know, it, it calculates all the hits, so it's like, you know, the red hits, and red's best, blue, then green, then yellow, right? It gets all those hits. It, um, you know, it sees which ones are, it orders them in terms of quality, and then it groups them into, these are alternative contexts, these are on the regular reference genome. And then it assigns the map, the quality scores, knowing that that's an alternative and that's a perfectly valid thing to map to, right? It's not multi-mapping, those are the same region. It just is a, you know, it's a, it's a more correct map now. So it does a good job of actually pulling out these old things that map to these alts and putting them in the right place. Uh, so go for it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is a very small distance, but yeah. so, so it, this is kind of different way to think about the reference genome you know, because it's assuming that there's no recombination. That's like, I mean, so like, this, I'm thinking, what if there were two places where it was a perfect match, but somehow they were, you know, the, the alternate was always on a separate chromosome, but like, I guess the reason for it's the recombination within one read is essentially the chance that's zero. Right. But I mean, you see what I'm saying? Like, I mean, yeah. in fact, you could, that these two alternate concepts, a recombination event could occur, or now they're on the same concept, in the first three sequences, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's, that really speaks to having, uh, and I'll talk, I have that sort of, it's almost much time, I can tell us that as well, too, but uh, we have like a, the new representation should be really as much diversity as you can put into the reference you know, put it all in there, right? And so if you've ever seen that, put it in there, and then you, then you, when you map, you map correctly, you don't know you've seen that before. But yeah, it, it, if it's not represented, it's super complicated, it looks ugly, and we look at that job. Yeah, what time do you want me to leave to stop talking and eat lunch? Sorry. Because I can pick up the number. I mean, I think whenever it's a lot of a break point for you, that's closest as well. Okay, cool. I'll finish up the HLA stuff and then we can uh, yeah. then we can do that. Sounds good. Uh, right, so um, so can we type these HLAs as awesome support now for uh, for alternative alleles? And uh, there's a distribution, the thousand genomes put this together, which is the build 38 plus all the HLA alleles, so just jams them on the FASTA file and puts them all in there. Um, and VWMM will extract out these HLA reads and put them into a separate file and say, well, now you have all the reads that map to HLA, then it's just a FASTQ file of those, can you do something with them? Um, and what we did in BC Bio is use this other tool called OptiType, which this is literally, I did this this weekend, so I don't know a lot of time. <laughs> but it was, it was, you know, we're, BWA has a, has a calling method, but um, it wasn't uh, it wasn't really working super well for our, for our validation. So uh, we started using this tool called Opitype, um, which is really awesome. And it, it takes the, and it, it extracts and reads, maps them only to the HLA sequences, and then does, does calling on them. Um, and so just to explain how HLA type calling works, uh, the naming is like a whole world unto itself of if I was like, oh, we need to call HLAs, and then I looked at this naming scheme, and I wanted to give up, right? Because it's a, it's insane. But um, uh, there, you know, there's, there's a, this, I mentioned super hyper variable, and there's this naming scheme that reflects that. So there's the, the beginning is, uh, you have the HLA gene. This is the you know, HLA A, and there's B and C and D. There's a bunch of them, uh, and then they have an allele group that it falls into, and then a protein. So. What we're doing is, in the typing we're doing now, is typing up to here, it's this, the same HLA protein, so the same, uh, same epitope expressed, but then there's also additional variability. These are the synonymous changes that can happen, and then uh, changes in non-coding regions as well. So, you know, rep, like this, this nomenclature represents all this crazy diversity that can happen in these genes, and, uh, you know, then tries to, to make, uh, make sense of it, but look, what we're doing is just sort of these first two typing the same epitope, which is if you're doing T cell immunogenic stuff, uh, is, is mostly what you care about. But 
Aaron. Aaron knew more about the four typing rate. You need to, uh, if you need to do organ transplant, you need to know three type or four type. I think ideally four type, but I mean, I don't know what to do in practice. Yeah. Uh, well, the whole position. I thought, I thought it was four type. That's for like you can pretty much guarantee that you're not going to have a, uh, a organ rejection. So yeah, that's so. But but we're doing two, which is which is not too bad <laughs> as a starting place. Um, and so just as literally this is stuff this weekend, but uh, so I don't know how much we can push it. But um, we, there's this uh, test set from a Mixon which does HLA typing, and they have a, it's nice. They pulled out. They have some deep targeted uh, sequencing um, of only HLAs, and they have uh, exome uh, stuff from thousand genomes as well. And uh, and like I mentioned, resolution. To, it's called P group is the. Uh, the terminology for the for actual protein um, type two resolution, but um, for A, B, and C, and if, if you're interested in this, there's like a just here of uh, the results, but it's awesome. I was I was really I was really fired up. Uh, you literally get all the all the targeting correct and almost all the exome except for uh, one uh, wrong. So you know what this is doing is letting us. You run a standard, you run a standard exome, or you run a standard uh, whole genome sequencing. Now you can get this HLA type thing you couldn't get before um, as a sort of standard output. And in the practical example, I can show you what it looks like for the. It's a synthetic cancer run, so I don't know what the HLA type means, but uh, you can get the HLA type call out of it. Um, and I mean, the reason this is so hard, right, is that HLA is just complex. So this is. Um, uh, this is Eric Garrison from a slide from Eric Garrison's uh, VG tool, um, one of his presentations on that. But you know, trying to represent sort of as a graph what the different possible variations in this region, and uh, it's, it's a it's a mess, right? You can see there's just like a, you know within a within a small region there's already this ridiculous uh, uh, complexity, and you know the way that the community is trying to represent these, which is the move sort of trying to get these hard regions figured out is to represent them as a graph instead of as a linear thing with just old stack on top of it. Um, and you know the advantage there is then you can represent these really complex things where you have, well in this genome, this region is not here, it's over here, and now it's back over here. Um, you have some way to represent that as opposed to just, you know, flat, I don't know, that thing's totally different. And that sort of build up the complexity. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the tools, I mentioned VG, that's the tool from uh, Eric Garrison, is one of the sort of the tools that's really being developed now that I think will hopefully be something we can do, we can use in the future. Um, this is a nice cartoon of sort of the approach that I think it, it actually, the, 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 the part I cut off of the slide that I stole from him is that it doesn't actually work yet, right? But uh, <laughs> this is the, uh, this is from also last week, uh, somebody presented internally, but um, this is the vision of sort of future variant calling is um, is that you know you do this alignment and you map you know you map your reads to a graph instead of mapping them to a linear genome um, and then they they how they stack up relative to that graph and then you call those reads based on that graph so you have an idea of you know within that graph there's the a and the c there keep the pointer um, you know you have the idea that those are already on you know those are in different representations you know it's not a hat you know it's two different things in the genome, um, and you can assign the reads relative to that, um, and then you can call, you know, variants <coughs> based on that, and then I'll put that back in some form that you can make sense of. And so, you know, this is sort of the the thing that we're doing with HLA, which is, you know, pulling out all these things, doing a specialized assembly against the, you know, set of things, and doing specialized calling. We should be able to do eventually everywhere um, with this sort of tooling, and you know. You know, you do all that for HLA, you want to look at the you know, VDG regions or some other complex region, uh, you need to redo all the tooling for that. This would let us do it in sort of a, a really general way. Cool, I thought that was a good, I was trying to talk fast to stop uh, so people can eat, but uh, the other things I was going to, I think afterwards we could talk about the um, low frequency somatic calling structure variant stuff and then do the practical, uh, you know, I can talk or do practical, whatever you guys prefer. Eat lunch, yeah? Cool.